Talks. Black Star Network is here. Hold no punches. I'm real uh, revolutionary right now. Black Power. We support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. I thank you for being the voice of Black America, Rolling. Hey, Black, I love y'all. All momentum we have now. We have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig?
So today's Monday, November 6, 2023, coming up on Roland Martin Unfiltered, streaming live on the Black Star Network. Folks, it's election day. It is election day. And uh, also uh, races are taking place all across the country. And so we're going to be covering those uh, races, uh, talking about what's happening in Philadelphia, what's happening in uh, uh, Mississippi, Virginia, Houston. The night before the election, a lot going on. Trust me, the impact on African Americans is huge depending upon where you are from. Also, President Joe Biden polling data shows mm, he has an issue when it comes to black and Latino voters. Hashtag, we tried to tell you what needs to be done. We'll break down the numbers. We'll uh, look at what the writers of that article pointed out. We'll also talk to political strategist L. Joy Williams and also pollster Terrence Woodbury about it as well. A Colorado jury uh, acquits the third officer to stand trial for Elijah McClain's death. Also, Donald Trump take the stand, took the stand in New York and acted a damn fool. No shock there. Also, it's Caregiver Awareness Month. In tonight's Fit Live Win segment, what you need to know to prepare to care for your aging or ailing loved ones. It's time to bring the funk of Roller Martin Unfiltered with Black Star Network. Let's go. He's got it. Whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the find. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. With entertainment just for kicks, he's rolling. Tuesday's election day all across the United States. Some of the races to watch. Kentucky Governor Andy Bashir, Democrat versus Republican, Black Republican Daniel Cameron. We're also looking at the tight race for governor in Mississippi between Republican Tate Reeves and Democrat Brandon Presley. Also, uh, there are legislative races, uh, runoffs in Louisiana, Mississippi, New Jersey, Virginia, uh, that will elect folks to the state legislatures. Virginia is critical. If Democrats pick up three seats there, you will have a black Speaker of the House uh, in Don Scott. Rhode Island and Utah are having a special congressional election. Utah Celeste Malloy and Kathleen Reby are battling with Republican Chris Stewart's seat. He resigned in September uh, in Rhode Island. Gabe uh, Amo and Gary Leonard Jr. are vying for Democrat David uh, Ciceline's seat, who resigned in May. Local elections are also on the ballot in cities across the country. Uh, you have State Senator John Whitmire against Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee uh, and others for the mayor's race in Houston. We're looking at Philadelphia, Pennsylvania at large city council seats. Two third party candidates from the Progressive Working Families Party are fighting to keep their seats. If they succeed, there will be no Republicans on Philadelphia City Council next term. You also have a state Supreme Court race there. That's going to be huge when it comes to the 2024 election. Joining me right now, folks, uh, is the National Director of the Work and Families Party, uh, Maurice uh, Mitchell. Uh, Maurice, glad to have you here. First of all, let's talk about these races. Um, how significant are they? What does it mean for black voters? Well, every election is so critical, and it's so important for black voters to turn out um, on, in all of these elections. But particularly, I want to focus your attention on Philadelphia, because we have an opportunity to make history. So in Philadelphia, at-large city council, there's seven at-large city council seats, and two of them have historically been reserved for Republicans. And we think it's outrageous that in a, a black and very democratic city like Philadelphia, that Republicans are able to basically, without 
very much campaigning, just kind of waltz into city council. So in 2019, we challenged them with two independent Working Families Party candidates, Kendra Brooks and Nicholas O'Rourke. Kendra won, and she made history. She made Black history. She made Philadelphia history. And she became the first independent Working Families Party candidate to win at large city council, kicking off that Republican. And now in 2023, we're trying to finish the job with Nicholas O'Rourke joining her again so that he could kick off the last Republican in city um, in Philadelphia City Council. Um, obviously, this is a third party, obviously third party uh, can, if you will. And what I've always said to people, third, part, third party candidates can actually uh, work. Uh, they've, been, they've been much more successful on local level than they have been on statewide national level. Well, you know, I, you know, I asked uh, your viewers if they've ever heard of Tish James, who is the attorney, attorney general of, of the state of New York. She started off as an independent Working Families Party candidate for city council. Jumani Williams, similarly, he started off as an independent Working Families Party candidate for city council. He, he's, he's now, you know, one of the, the leading politicians in New York City. Um, you know, Brandon Johnson, who is the, the mayor of the, the city of, of Chicago, uh, he's one of our Working Families Democrats that we worked with United Working Families, the, our, our affiliate in, in Chicago, in order to get him elected. You know, the Working Families Party is an independent, um, independent third party all across this country, led by black folks. It's a multiracial coalition. And, you know, we understand that that some third third party efforts have not worked. We thought very carefully about how to arrange a situation where we could run and win. And we endorsed more than a thousand candidates up and down the, the ballot. And we sometimes use the, the Democratic Party's primary in order to recruit independent working families Democrats to challenge corporate Democrats. And sometimes, like in the case of Philadelphia, where they have these unique laws, we're able to run independent working families party candidates to, to, to run in local office. And again, it's, it's based upon uh, how the laws are set up at that particular locale, but also uh, it's, uh, it, it's also uh, based upon ballot access. At the end of the day, that's what it comes down to. You can have people run, you can have people say, hey, uh, you know, I, I, want me, I want to run third party. Okay, but do you have ballot access? That's what you need in order to compete. Yeah, absolutely. And so in states like New York and, Calif uh, and, and Connecticut, where there's something called fusion, the Working Families Party has ballot access. And in cities like Philadelphia and some cities in, in Connecticut, we have these minority party set-asides. And then, like I said, all across the country, uh, people with independent politics could engage in their, in, their, in their primaries. And we're able to engage in that debate through the Democratic primary. We cook what we have in the kitchen, Roland. So uh, we try to use whatever is available to us for independent voices to speak. We believe something very simple, that in a democracy, the people should govern, not corporations and the wealthy. And so we try to use whatever is available to us in order to make that happen. And we recruit everyday people. Kendra Brooks, for example, she's a mother. She's from North, she's from North Philly, Nice Town, and she still lives in Nice Town. And she represents the very best of us. She's one of those people where you might say, why can't somebody like Kendra be an elected official? Well, we work to recruit her, and we work to surround her with the community in order to make that happen. And we do that in Philly and in more than 20 states around the country. All right. Well, we certainly will be seeing uh, what happens there in uh, Philadelphia uh, in a, a number of different local and statewide races that we are paying attention to. All right. It's, it's a pleasure to have this conversation. And we look forward to black folks who are interested in independent politics coming down to the Working Families Party. There's a lot of opportunities to... If you're serious about independent politics, there's a lot of cynical people who suggest that the Democrats take this for granted, but then they try to suggest that somehow the Republicans are a better option. There are independent black voices that are building viable alternatives, and we look forward to engaging anybody that's interested. All right. We certainly appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Folks, we're going to go to a quick break. We come back. We're going to talk about this, but also talk about uh, uh, statewide races that are happening in Pennsylvania that will have an impact on next year. Who controls the county election procedure? Who controls the state Supreme Court? But also, we'll talk about Kentucky, Mississippi, so many different elections taking place across the country. We always have uh, a decrease in voter turnout in what's called off election years. That should not be an excuse for black people. We can be determining who wins these elections if we actually show up. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network.
the next Get Wealthy with me, Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach. Are you trying to figure out how to earn more revenue in your business during these volatile times? Learn how to tap into the largest marketplace in the world through government contracting. Our next guest, Akia Hardnett, will be sharing how you can get wealthy through government contracting. We've got a young lady, government uh, assistance to government contracts. She literally was um, on government assistance when she came to us and in less than a year, she has been winning um, multiple government contracts and it has changed the trajectory of her family. That's right here, only on Black Star Network. I'm Dee Barnes, and next on The Frequency, we talk to award-winning screenwriter and director Chanel Dupree about her film, You Think You've Grown, The Adultification of Young Black Girls. This is a conversation that all women can relate to. This woman was like, oh my God, you know, I I went through this when I was a kid. She wore something, it was a maxi dress, but the way it fit on her body, this uh, female teacher thought that she looked too grown and spun her around in front of a male teacher and said, "What do do you think she looks grown, right? Oh, my God. So that's next time on The Frequency on the Black Star Network. What's up, everybody? It's your girl, Latasha, from the A. And you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. All right, folks, so we talk about those races in the Philadelphia uh, local, but also what's happening statewide is also critically important. Go to my iPad here. Uh, this is from Bolts Magazine. Uh, the people, the county officials uh, are huge in uh, Pennsylvania. They can determine uh, who controls drop boxes, mail voting, you name it. Well, guess what? They're all on the ballot. And MAGA people are trying to take over all of these races. You also have uh, a critical Supreme Court race there where you have a MAGA um, a uh, Republican who is trying to be on the state Supreme Court. Why does that matter? Because it was the state Supreme Court uh, that made a number of decisions uh, that impacted the 2020 presidential election. Let's talk about this here, uh, both of these issues uh, with my panel. Uh, joining me right now, folks, uh, is Dr. Julian Malvo, economist, president emerita at Bennett College. Uh, she is uh, from D.C., Dr. the Amakongo Dabinga, uh, senior professorial lecturer. Uh, School of International Service, American University out of D.C., Renita Shannon, full, former Georgia State Representative out of Atlanta. Uh, the thing here, uh, Omicongo, uh, as I said there, third-party races at the end of the day, um, you have, they have worked successfully on the local level as opposed to when you go more statewide, uh, when you go national. And, uh, but at the end of the day, everything comes to turnout. So you can have a third party, but if people actually don't vote, guess what? They can't win. Uh, And so uh, it's amazing to me when I listen to these people on social media and other platforms who complain about what's not being done, and I'm going, guess what? The folks who are winning, they ain't complaining. They're voting. Absolutely. And that's really what it comes down to at the end of the day. And when when you're talking to Mr. Mitchell and they were talking about in Philadelphia, you know, two seats, you know, reserved for Republicans and or you know, the quote unquote party that's in the minority in a particular city, you know, everything is up for grabs as it relates to being able to challenge the system. And that's how too many times in many of these local elections some of these guys just get over because people just don't turn out because they think the local politics don't affect them. When I ran for city council in D.C., I was talking to somebody and they said, I don't do that politics stuff. And, you know, there's so there's a real turnout problem in these elections that don't revolve around the presidential election. And so I appreciate the fact that, you know, this third party, Mr. Mitchell's party, is working and being active. But that turnout piece that's going to be the biggest issue. And sometimes people just have this mentality of, oh, well, these guys got it in the bag. These guys are the incumbents. You know, we see this all of the time. And we have to understand that our opponents, they will spend all of their time talking MAGA this or talking anti-democratic that. They'll put out all the bluster, but they will show up at the polls, period, bottom line. And we see too many times, even on the national level, Roland, many people get out there, this protest or that protest. I wonder how many people are out there in these rallies now, you know, for Israel, Palestine, and they're like, when it comes down to the election, are going to vote locally, you know, are going to vote 
vote, you know, for the statewide, are going to vote nationally, now or never, especially as you laid out coming out of the break, how MAGA folks are, have infiltrated areas of government like we've never thought before. Of course, they didn't have the bigger turnout in the midterms that we that they thought, which is great, but they're still very present and can provide real serious problems in certain elections. And we have to overwhelm that so there's no question about it whatsoever. Um, what Republicans count on, Renita, they count on shrinking the electorate. They've admitted, several of them across the country, when the electorate is expanded, they are likely going to lose. And so if people choose to sit out, all you're doing is just helping them in their cause, then you can't complain when stuff happens later because you didn't participate. And so, I, I, again, I think Pennsylvania is a perfect example of whether we're talking about these local elections in Philadelphia or whether we're talking about the uh, uh, statewide. If, you, if you're sitting here worried about these MAGA folks taking over, you can defeat them on the county level. Otherwise, they're going to be in control of ballot drop boxes. They're going to be in control of making election decisions, closing polling places, opening polling places. This is real. Republicans not only rely on shrinking the electorate, they also rely on cheating. And I've seen that firsthand, legal cheating through the law, which means passing bills that are meant to target certain communities to make sure that their vote is depressed and to make sure that they are not able to um, have their votes counted even when they do turn out. And so there's multiple things at work. I'm glad to see the Working Families Party, which is not a new party, um, they've been around for some time now. I'm glad to see them picking up steam in Philadelphia. They've had a lot of great success in New York. Uh, what most people probably don't know is that there. I'm not aware of any states in the nation where a third party um, candidate cannot enter a race. It's just a question of how high the hurdle is for a third party candidate to enter. The main thing with these third party candidates is this: that you have to do so much education around what that third party stands for and what that candidate stands for, because people are used to. Um, voting for either a, a Democrat or Republican as a part of the two-party system. But things are changing, and we have even seen at some of the higher-level elections where you've had write-in candidates actually um, come in and win elections. So nothing is impossible, but it all comes down to turnout and education um, of the candidates that are on the ballot. And so I love Working Families Party. They have supported me every time that I've, I've run for office. Um, they are the one party that I know that I can count on that will say something when um, many others will decide that something is too—an issue is too controversial to speak about. I can always count on Working Families Party to speak up and speak out. Here's a perfect example, Julian. Go, go to my iPad. It says, as one of the two Democrats on the three-member county commission, uh, this person here, um, Bob Harvey, was responsible for the county's voting procedures, and he wanted people to vote safely during the pandemic. With his support, Bucks County installed ballot drop boxes and notified roughly 1,600 voters that they had made a clerical mistake on their mail ballot, such as forgetting to date their envelopes, giving them the opportunity to correct it, a common procedure known as ballot curing. <laughs> Quote, the Republican Party and the Trump campaign wanted things done a certain way. We didn't do things the way they wanted to, so they sued us. Clearly, we'd follow the law because we won all these suits. Recalls Harvey, who is running for re-election in two weeks. The race will determine what party controls Bucks County's commission during the next presidential election. Now, somebody would say, that's not a city council member. That's not a state rep. That's not a state senator. Why does that even matter? Well, guess what? Whoever controls that election board, they can say, nope, you don't get to notify, notify people uh, of their ballots being messed up. That's 1,600 votes. We saw that in Texas, where they passed laws saying state officials couldn't do certain things. And there were thousands and thousands of ballots, many of them uh, African-American, uh, that could not be fixed. This is what happens. Republicans will say, oh, sorry, they should have read it. And so people may say, that, yeah, that, that little small county, that board, that commission is just as critical than any other official because they can determine who gets counted and who doesn't. Absolutely, Roland. And the thing about this that's uh, intriguing, I won't say intriguing, but it's troubling to see the ways that the Republicans have attempted to block ballot access. As you know, I'm doing all this research on lynching, which is kind of Trump cumbersome. But the, the so-called last lynchings in 1946 occurred after 
um, in Georgia, Talmadge, uh, ran for governor, and they basically took guns, et cetera, to take black people away from the polls. Well, they don't use guns anymore. What they do is all this uh, finagling about who gets access and how. And so every election is critical. I mean, I really pray, just pray, that our people understand that. I was walking down the street on Saturday, ran into a bunch of uh, young people who had come from the Palestinian march, and we started chatting. And two of these young women said to me, we will never vote for Biden. I said, so who are you going to vote for? And what they said was they weren't going to vote at all. I find that frightening, especially given, you know, the New York Times poll that talks about young people being disengaged, especially young people of color being disengaged. And what we know is every single election is extraordinarily important. And when we look at what's happening, as you said, in Pennsylvania, but all over the country, these smaller elections are ones that people choose to ignore, but they really lead up to the larger elections. If Bucks County does not elect the right people, that will affect what happens in um, Pennsylvania, because it's one county that had 1,600 votes. But what does that mean to the next county and the next county and the next? We really are in a crisis situation, and people need to understand it. And what we really need to understand is that every election counts, whether it's for dog catcher uh, or for president. Every election counts. Uh, well, when we come back, folks, we're going to talk about uh, polling data. Now, granted, it's a year out, but there are things you can take from it. Now, what we saw in the polling data ain't new to us here. We've been trying to tell folks this for quite some time. So what is needed? What is needed to be done uh, to reach voters? I dare say what should be happening is a massive education program by the Biden-Harris administration, by the Democratic Party, by all of these PACs, because it's a lot of stuff, folk, when you tell them what was done, they go, damn, I didn't know. We'll talk to political strategist Joy Williams, the old Joy Williams, as well as pollster Terrence Woodbury about that very issue uh, when we come back right here on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Folks, don't forget your support is critically important for us doing what we are doing. Uh, and so we talk about uh, the issues that we uh, cover. Nobody else is doing this. You are, there is no, let me repeat, there is no black owned media outlet that is doing daily news the way we are doing it. You've got five hours of original content every single day on the Black Star Network. You've heard me say it. Essence ain't doing it. Ebony not doing it. Byron Allen, the Grio not doing it. Uh, Bla uh, Blavity's not doing it. I can go on and on and on. All of the, not Urban One, not Radio One, not all these folks, they're not doing it. And so your support is critical for us to continue the great work that we're doing here uh, to support our staff, to support our hosts. Uh, it is vitally important. We're fighting a good fight when it comes to advertising dollars. We're fighting a good fight when it comes to getting political ad dollars. Uh, but your support matters. Send your check and money order to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. Cash app, dollar side, RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R. Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale is rolling at rollingsmartin.com, rolling at rollingmartinunfiltered.com. We'll be right back. Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. White people are losing their damn minds. An angry pro-Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol. We're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to 
be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. Bye bye, Papa. I'm Dr. Jackie Hood Martin, and I have a question for you. Ever feel as if your life is teetering and the weight and pressure of the world is consistently on your shoulders? Well, let me tell you, living a balanced life isn't easy. Join me each Tuesday on Black Star Network for a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We'll laugh together, cry together, pull ourselves together, and cheer each other on. So join me for new shows each Tuesday on Black Star Network, a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. I'm Joe Marie Payton, voice of Sugar Mama on Disney's Louder and Prouder Disney Plus, and I'm with Roland Martin on Unfiltered. Folks, welcome back to Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Uh, over the weekend, oh my goodness, all of these different political people lost their minds because the New York Times, uh, Siena, dropped their poll, uh, which showed that uh, Donald Trump is leading in nearly all battleground states except one. The poll also showed uh, that uh, Biden is not doing well with Hispanic voters, or black voters, showing some 22% of black voters uh, will be supporting uh, Donald Trump. Uh, this has even caused folks like David Axelrod to say Biden needs to consider dropping out of the race. And so we can go on and on and on. Now, let me be very clear, okay? New York Times, a year before the election, 2012, had a poll that says Ob uh, uh, Biden, excuse me, Obama's toast. Literally. They were talking about how, how Obama was going to lose re-election. Well, we actually saw what happened. He crushed Mitt Romney. But I do believe that there is value uh, to look at what these polls are saying today because it can then dictate what folks should be doing over the next 12 months. Now, I've been talking about uh, these issues a lot uh, with uh, Terrence Woodbury. He is the founding partner of uh, Hit Strategies, uh, one of our top pollsters. Uh, I've had these conversations uh, with political strategist L. Joy Williams. She's been on the ground working, working for campaigns, doing work also, uh, working on behalf of uh, getting black women elected. So, Terrence, I want to start with you because, so whenever we hear these polls, a lot of times, um, we know there are a lot of trash polls out there, a whole lot. And so what is your assessment of the efficacy uh, or the legitimacy of this poll? Is it a solid poll? Absolutely. Look, New York Times Siena poll is a gold standard. They are, they are one, of the, one of the data uh, outlets that I trust the most. Um, that said, Roland, I think that the way that you presented this is, is exactly right. This poll does not tell us who's going to win the race. <clears throat> what it does tell us is where there are some gaps, where the, where the coalition, the Biden coalition, is beginning to splinter, and where they need to invest their time and, most important, their resources to shore up this coalition that's, that is showing some, some erosion. Um, and I use the comparison of same poll 2011. It was showing there were some issues. And... I'm going to say something a lot of people don't even really begin to under, who don't even want to understand. Uh, 2012, spring 2012, the Obama administration really had no plans uh, to speak at any of the black uh, organizations, the various conventions. They didn't. They went to Sharpton's conference in 2011. Uh, they were the Urban League in 2010, NAACP in 2009. So there were no plans in 2012. What happened? Polls were showing there was some softness among black voters. All of a sudden, at the last minute, they decided to go speak to the National Urban League Convention in 2012. I remember it vividly, because I was asking various folks, where is he speaking? If anybody go back and check, 
He only spoke at one black convention a year. Facts are facts, okay? So then that's when they announced this HBCU initiative, this White House initiative, which to this day, I still have no idea what the hell it was. And I kept asking people what was it about, but they needed something to announce. So the reality is, uh, those po that polling data then, it let the Obama folks know, hey, bruh, you, you gonna get, a, you gonna get the black vote, but the issue is not the percentage of black voters, it's actually how many are going to show up, the turnout. That's, a, that's exactly right, Roland. And look, that's, that's what we're seeing in this poll when we see a 25-point erosion amongst voters of color, um, amongst um, black voters, 25-point erosion from Biden's 2020 support, amongst Latino voters, 24-point erosion, amongst young voters, uh, a 20-point erosion. That is the foundation of the base. And look, I, I want to be clear, this is not crises level. These aren't crises level numbers because of where we are in the cycle, but it does show you that we have a lot of work to do because one thing we know is that this is this is Donald Trump's strategy. Donald Trump isn't trying to get to 50 plus one. He's not trying to reach to the middle and expand his coalition and, and persuade new voters. Donald Trump is trying to win the same way he won in 2016. He has a floor and he has a ceiling and it's right around 46 or 47 percent. Well, guess what? That was enough. 46 percent was enough for him to win. And the only way that's possible is by making his opponent less popular than he is. He was successful at that with Hillary Clinton because of some of the baggage that she brought uh, uh, to, the, to that cycle. And he was not able to do that with Joe Biden. Even the p folks that didn't vote for Joe Biden in 2020, they didn't not like him. Well, now what we're seeing here is that amongst some of this, this coalition, they are registering discontent. They're registering frustration. <clears throat> when we look at what happens in the generic race in the same poll, we see a lot of these voters come home. We see, a lot of, we see that, that, that margin that he had amongst young voters expand again. But right now, this is, a, this is a red flag to the campaign to put your money where your mouth is, invest in, in the communities, dance with the one that brought you to the dance, you know? And that's what folks are asking. And frankly, Roland, I do think a lot of what we're seeing in this poll is some is it, it, a lot of this is, is is a reaction to the conflict that is dominating a lot of our news cycle. And one thing we know is that young voters and voters of color, those closest to the pain, they aren't too partial towards foreign investments of billions of dollars in countries on the other side of the world while their communities don't have what they need. And I think that's a lot of what we're seeing here is a warning sign to the White House, a warning sign to the Biden campaign. Don't take us for granted. <clears throat> Put your money where your mouth is. And before you make uh, deeper foreign investments, explain the investments that you've already made domestically. So let, let's also uh, uh, unpack this. Uh, when you and I talked um, before the election in 2022, you, you laid out uh, information that you discovered in all of these different focus groups, especially with black men, but you did, but you had black men and black women. And what really jumped out at me then was that the concept of when you don't know, you don't know. And how your focus groups shifted when voters were actually told, because people said, uh, ain't nothing been done. And That's then right. y'all went, this, 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 this. Then folks went, Oh, damn. That's right. We didn't know That's that. Right. And you literally had a shift in the poll, in, in your focus groups, correct? That's exactly right, Ronald. Look, uh, the last time we polled over the, over the summer, 76% of black voters said that their lives had not improved since Joe Biden became president. 76%. If that number is still... If that number holds... What is... I'm sorry. Uh, no, no, don't worry about it. Keep talking. Just keep talking. Uh, yeah, okay, keep you talking. can still hear me. Okay, so if yeah, we that got number you. holds, if 76% if of black folks in November of 2024 say that their lives haven't improved, we have a problem. And so what we found is, you know, when, when, you, when you look at the issues that black folks prioritize the most, economy and gun control, um, uh, uh, affordable housing, student loan forgiveness, Joe Biden has made tremendous progress. I tell folks all the time, this is the student loan president and the criminal justice reform president and the climate change president. Uh, and the, the jobs president, because he has done more on each of those issues than all of his predecessors. You talk about criminal justice reform. I mean, appointing more black women 
to the bench, including the first black woman to the Supreme Court, more uh, uh, pattern and practice investigations than the last four presidents combined. He is getting it done. Unfortunately, this is where I think we have a messaging problem and not a governing problem. He's going to have to be the explainer and chief. He's right. going to have to explain the progress that's been made and tell people how they can access it. How can you go get $35 insulin in your community? How can you go get some of the millions of jobs that have been created by this infrastructure bill? They don't want to just be told how much politicians in Washington have gotten done. Right. They want to be told how it makes their lives better. I also think that um, uh, you have to also explain to people who, who have no clue in terms of uh, really what, what politics is all about. In, in fact, I'll give you a perfect example. Um, uh, Twitter is all abuzz today because the Republican National Committee, uh, what they did is they took a particular comment made by Congresswoman Jasmine Crockett, uh, and they have been pushing it on social media, and a whole bunch of black folks uh, who don't know better uh, jumped on it and reposted it, not even having the full context of what Jasmine laid out. Uh, and so it achieved their, their, their purpose. So I want to play this and then I want to come back to you with, with, your, with your research shows. Uh, so here's what Jasmine Crockett said yesterday on CNN. Congresswoman Jasmine Crockett of Texas. Here's the deal. Perception is reality. And so when you look at the data that was provided in this poll, it talks about how people feel. And when people decide whether they're going to the poll or whether they're not going to, to the poll, it's all about how you feel in that moment. And so while the facts may not align with their feelings, their feelings are dictating their reality. Their reality is that they said that they feel better or they felt better when Trump was in office. But we've been trying to push back. We've got some very popular African-American artists that are out here saying things like, oh, I got checks when Trump was in office. I want those checks again, not mm. understanding that that really came from Congress. Mm. So we've got a couple of things, the perception issue. And then we also have an issue as it relates to civics in this country and people not understanding exactly how any of this works. Here's the deal. Now, there Perception was some people is um, who were going, uh, Jasmine, and the, and the RNC tried to say that Jasmine Crockett was trying to call black people dumb. No. What she was saying is what I've said on this show for a very long time. Donald Trump did not hand out stimulus checks. It was a democratically controlled Congress that passed the bills. Then it went to the Senate. Then it went to the president's signature. And then they went out. And, and so we can go on. But here's the other thing. There were more, there was more stimulus right. provided by Biden, Harris, than Trump. Y'all, COVID hit February, March 2020. You had all that year. Trump's out by January. And so when people are talking about these checks, do folks forget the checks that happened when Biden was president? Uh, the American Rescue Plan, the checks that also allowed HBCUs uh, to write off uh, infrastructure loans. I can go on and on and on. But here's the other deal, Terrence, that's real basic. Black people, those checks ain't happening again. That was a once-in-a-lifetime moment. The PPP loans, all that stuff that was going out, that ain't happening again. So this notion that Trump is going to come in and just start handing out checks... No, you're not. No, that's exactly right, Roland. We hear this in focus groups. When I, when I ask folks in focus groups, was your life better under Donald Trump or under Joe Biden? I, am, I, I used to be surprised when black folks told me that their life was better under Donald Trump. Even black folks that didn't want to vote for him were pointing to some of the economic uh, advancement that they felt like they made. Well, but, 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 also, but also, stay right there. But for those black people... Let's also remind people, 2007, 2008, massive housing crisis. Bush leaves. Obama comes in. 2009, 2010, 2011, our economy was awful. Then you had a resurgence, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Donald Trump was handed on a silver platter like he's got his entire life an economy that was surging ahead. And he benefited in 17, 
18, 19, boom, COVID hits in 20. 41% of black-owned businesses out of business due to COVID. Supply demand, craters. So, folks, got to re- we had COVID, 20,000, 2020, 2021, half of 2022. The reality is we're still coming out of that. And so to act as if COVID didn't exist, you had to come out of that. And the, and the economy, it's clear from a job standpoint, Again, this is not, oh, man, you back and buy it. No, it's a factual standpoint. But the reality is inflation, grocery prices, gas prices, all of those things that was led led by corporate greed, that's hitting the pocketbooks. And a lot of those COVID benefits are now disappearing, including the child care credits. That's right. Listen, the child tax credit was amongst the most popular policies that the Biden administration put forward, and it, and it is one that, that black folks overwhelmingly want to see continued. But look, you're, you're spot on, Roland. <clears throat> the, what people are feeling and, and what Congresswoman Crockett, a very good friend and, and, and what I, who I think is a very important voice and messenger um, for folks that just don't hear from, from the White House or they don't, they don't resonate with the voices that are that are coming from the White House, they need to hear from folks like Jasmine Crockett, and we need to give her a bigger microphone to reach more of these young voters that don't see themselves reflected in the party. But beyond that, this is she was spot on. You know, this is a civic engagement exercise. We have to to teach folks about the process, exactly what you're doing here. We're educating folks about the process and the timelines, because when folks tell me. That, that the reason that their lives were better under Donald Trump or the things that they liked was because he was investing in HBCUs, despite Joe Biden investing more. And in fact, in fact, he wasn't. Donald Trump's budget zeroed the money out for HBCUs. It was right. Congresswoman Alma Adams. That program Trump's keep taking credit for, it was Congresswoman Alma Adams who put it back in, who fought for it in the House. And when Senator Lamar Alexander held it up in the Senate, that's when Trump, looking for a win, was like, hey, Lamar, back off that hole, then it got passed. Trump didn't know a damn thing about that program that was started under Bush, continued under Obama, expired. That's a fact. Go ahead. But look, I, look, I bet you this is something that every one of your viewers will remember. If they don't know where the bill came from, if they don't know how much yep. Trump gave to HBCUs, I bet you one thing they remember is a picture of 50 black HBCU presidents in the little Oval Office with Kellyanne Conway with her feet up in the damn on the couch taking the picture. I mean, that is the moment that, yes. that, that burned into people's heads that make them say, oh, Donald Trump was giving so much money to HBCUs when, in fact, Joe Biden has given twice as much. But there was no Rose Garden moment. There was no Oval Office moment, the photo op yep. of, the, of the HBCU presence. That's what we're missing here. It's the showmanship. Yep. It's the, the theater of the progress that's being made. And we got to take this show on the road now. We're not going to be able to do it from the Oval Office. And that's why I was glad to see the vice president on that HBCU tour for the last few weeks. Great point. Hold tight one second. Uh, I know El Joy is ready to hop in because that's exactly why I want to talk to her about because I have been saying this repeatedly. Democrats, this is very simple. You have to be engaging in a mass mobilization, mass education process, and you can't do it with TV ads. You can't do it at the last second come August and September and October. No, it should be starting January 1. We'll break it down when we come right back. Uh, Folks, hold tight one second. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, we're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We're going to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind $100,000, so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Checks and money orders go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-Dash. 
0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zelle is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. I'm Farai Muhammad, live from LA. And this is The Culture. The Culture is a two-way conversation. You and me, we talk about the stories, politics, the good, the bad, and the downright ugly. So join our community every day at 3 p.m. Eastern and let your voice be heard. Hey, we're all in this together. So let's talk about it and see what kind of trouble we can get into. It's The Culture, weekdays at 3, only on the Black Star Network. Hey, I'm Donnie Simpson. Yo, it's your man Dion Cole from Blackish, and you watch Roland Martin Unfiltered. I'm going to start with Eldroy Williams. Eldroy, you and I have had this conversation numerous times, uh, and I, I, I love watching these other shows where they, that they dance around it. Let's just be perfectly clear, because we can say this here, because, hell, I own it. None of this, none of the stuff that we are talking about today is going to change until white strategists in the Democratic Party get the hell out of the way, stop controlling the money, and listen to black people like you and black people like Terrence and Ron Lester and Cornell Belcher and so many others and understand that the one-size-fit-all strategy to reach black people no longer works. Fewer black people are self-identifying as Democrats, which means you have to be micro-targeting black people, and you better be engaged in a massive education program, which means town halls, national conversations, and all these communities to tell people and teach them what is being done. Otherwise, they're going to believe you haven't done, Jack. Yeah. Well, yeah, we've had this conversation over multiple years <laughs> um, in a lot of different uh, places, a lot of different cities, and a lot of different states regarding a number of different campaigns, both presidential, um, statewide, and local. And, you know, to, to start, I, I have to agree with Terrence in terms of this is a roadmap. As a strategist, as on campaigns often, if I would be given this poll a year out from the race of my uh, candidate, right, it gives us to helps to influence the path that we're going to take, where we're going to invest our money, where we need to hire people, how we need to invest and change up or embolden a strategy that we have before. So this is partly a gift to the Democrats and to the Biden-Harris administration um, that they should be taking in the room and, and restructuring their plan. Because I can tell you what the plan is. The plan is to do the same thing they've always done. <laughs> and so if they are not taking this and seeing how we can change and move up our timetable and invest in strategies that are not just television ads, <clears throat> not just those last minute radio ads, but really develop relationships in those uh, communities and with those voters that are not motivated to turn out, that is what's needed, particularly for that 18 to, say, 34 population, which are, is a prime target for misinformation and disinformation mm -hmm. that we're seeing, right? And the only thing that combats misinformation and disinformation is relationship. I mm -hmm. use an example all the time. You know, I'm president of the Brooklyn NAACP, and I have members that come to our meetings, and they're parroting to me information that they saw on Facebook or Twitter. But it's because they have a relationship with me, with the membership, that if I give them the correction and give them their information, that they trust it. They're not going to trust an ad. <laughs> They're not going to trust a television or radio ad. They're going to trust the relationships that they have in their communities. And, and that's why I... Go, go, ahead. Ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. 
And that's where I have to agree with you that part of the strategy has to be educating people along the way is what what I do every week on Sunday civics, right? So Biden has to not only the Biden Harris administration and the Democrats now also not only have to talk about their wins, but they have their message has to be now give me the Congress that I need to continue That's to right. get things done, right? That's give right. me the governors that I need in That's order right. for this to come from the federal government to your state. Give me the state legislatures across the country that will take that money from the federal government, from the state government, and bring it down to your communities, right? That's there right. has to be that education, that civics education along the way. Because if you put yourself in a corner, if you just say, elect me, now people are just looking to you to fix it all. When well, that's not how it's done, right? So you have to educate yep. along the way and say, I'm able to do this much on student loan, and I've done a lot, but I can't do more unless I have the Congress to back me up, because when it gets to court, it's going to get struck down, right? I need, in order for me to address this climate change, and I've done a hell, lot, <laughs> a hell of a lot, but in order to make it permanent, in order to make sure that, we, you know, we don't regress back, I need the Congress to do it, right? And so that is what the administration has to do. That's what the Democrats have to do. And it has to be across the board, not only on the national level, but we have to break up some of these state parties to do the same thing. Perfect example. Um, when uh, Biden was in, uh, he gave a speech last year, I believe, uh, at North Carolina A&T. And uh, he he stood up there. He talked about, uh, you know, this is what uh, this is what we provided uh, HBCU funding more than seven billion dollars. And so I, I got a call from um, a Democratic operative, and then the person said, "Hey, what do you think about the speech?" I was like, "Eh, it was all right." They're like, "Wow, all right." I said, "Let me explain to you how things work with black people." If you stand in front of black people, and I think this applies to anybody, and you say, well, we've provided $7 billion to HBCUs. No, nope, that ain't what you say. What you say is, uh, a and I'm glad to be here. Um, I want y'all to understand that uh, your university, your university received, let me, let me pull this up. I want to pull up. Oh yeah, uh, I had the I'm, list too. I'm, I'm gonna pull up this here. See, to me, see this. This is how Roland would do it. This is this is just <laughs> Roll, okay? Uh, Roland would stand up and say, um, I, "I just want y'all to know uh, that uh, your university, North Carolina A uh, and T, um, this is the amount of money you got." No, 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 don't get my iPad yet. I, I'm fun. I'll tell you when to go. Um, what you do is you you sit here and you say. Um, we provided X amount of dollars uh, to you. The state provided this. So uh, let me let me pull it up. Uh, you got to see now. Go to my now. Go to my iPad. So you'll see right here uh, in this first Staggering. column. You see North Carolina A and T University. The state allocation to North Carolina A and T University was ninety five point four million dollars. That's this first column right here, y'all. Uh, that's his first column. So you see, 95.4 million. But then when you go all the way over, what you then say is, but a and you got $188 million from my administration. And then you said, since we in, since we in North Carolina, Winston-Salem State, you got $64.6 million from the state. You got $81 million from us. And then what you do is you start naming all of the universities in North Carolina stating this is how much you got. Then what you do is, if you go to North Carolina a and then what you say is, my administration, my administration uh, has provided $127 billion in, st in student debt relief. Uh, Cassandra, stand up. Kim, stand up. James, stand up. Uh, the students that are standing up collectively have more than $150,000 forgiven for student loans. That's what you do. You got to make this thing plain. That's not what they do. And I sit there and I'm like, and again, I know Trump was lying, but when he says, I saved HBCUs, I provided full funding to HBCUs, and all these Negroes ran with it. And I'm like, y'all, he lying. But you yeah. have to literally 
make it plain what you did, and then you can say, and at Meharry, they provided $1,500 for students at, uh, at uh, Bethune Cook. HBCUs actually gave money to students who were going back home. You got yeah. to say that, Joy. Well, you not only have to say that, because I would take it further if I was on staff. I would take it further and say that new building that just That's what I'm out, saying. That's, that's right. That's right. Wait a minute. I, I use the example I, that's, that's seen from my man Flipper from Jungle Fever when he was quitting, when he was like, mine, 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 mine. He was pointing out all the architecture's drawings that were his. He was like, yeah, that's mine. That's mine. That's mine. That's, right. That's exactly what you do. You say, yeah. we made this building possible. We made this construction project possible. Right. Oh, you see that building? a and It had $50 million of debt on it. We forgave that debt. Yeah. That's how and you got to talk. And to that point, like talking about the successes, you have to personalize it, right? It can't just be the talking points that you send to the Democratic talkers and to, you know, the, the memos they send out to us, Roland, right? Like, no, it has to be personalized. And so your information about student loans, I need to have some of the, track down some of those students and do those ads in their voices and talking about what we're able to do. And then if you give me the Congress I need, then we can do more and what that will result in in our communities. Again, yep. it has to be yep. stating what um, your success is, so stating the record, two, giving an example and making it personal, right? Identifying actual people, physical things, um, things in the community or even in their state. And then the third thing saying, and if you invest, and if you do this, not just vote for me, right? But if you do this, if you give me the Congress, right? If you give me the this and not asking for the vote in that way, then I can, we can do more and we can do more together, right? And that's what's missing. We do this, de the um, civics and in, in the uh, education on voting in this disjointed way when the federal, state, and local governments have to work in tandem in order for people to see real change in their community. That disenchantment that is reflected um, in polls, in the focus group that uh, Terrence talks about, again, when you give information it changes in that way. Yeah. And the reason why is because people aren't given the information right. in a way that resonates with them. The second part of that also is people need to see that my investment of time, my investment of voting, my uh, everything that you're telling me that this is the most you know, important election of my lifetime, I need to see that there's going to be some real transactional change in my community. And there are examples of that, but you have to start early. You can't do it in August. You can't do it in October, certainly. It has to start now. And that point you made, Roland, about breaking that institutional barrier, right? We just don't elect people to break institutional barriers in terms of policy. It also has to be in terms of who is making the decision decisions. Yep. It makes no sense if you have people that look like you or that come from your community in the position of power, if there is still an institutional barrier of the same white consultants that are saying the same thing that is making us lose or, or not letting us win as much as we can, right? And so that institutional barrier has to also be broken. And it can't just be token contracts, right? You know, you're the media buyer or you're this after we've already hired the people that are making the major decisions. You have to bring people to the table to challenge what has been done and yep. what has not been working. Uh, the fact that the Democrats at all have not been trying to chip away at that large, close to 80 million Americans who are not voting, boom. and either they're not registered or they're just not showing up, that's a problem. Uh, I'll tell you this here, Terrence, uh, real quick before I want to read this comment here. Uh, but... Reverend William Barber has been trying to get the White House a meeting with Biden with poor, affected people. So the White House keeps trying to invite Reverend Barber. He goes, no, I don't need a meeting. He says, when we meet with the Poor People's Campaign, we have affected people at the table. They still playing around. That's what you should be doing because they're out there on the ground trying to make it happen. Uh, but Terrence, here's a perfect example. This woman named Miss Mays on YouTube goes, this means nothing. My state receives millions for schools and it's not put into the community. Okay, Miss Mays, 
what's your state? If you're likely a red state, that guess what? That means that the money is going from the federal government to the Republican-controlled uh, legislature or the governor, and then they're dictating it. I am from I, born and raised in Houston, Texas. When it came to the hurricane relief money, Governor Greg Abbott refused to send a billion dollars to Harris County for relief for hurricane relief. A billion dollars. Why? Because it's blue. He wanted to penalize them. What did they do in the last legislature? They actually changed a law that impacted one of Texas's 254 counties, saying if we find any irregularities, we can call for a new election. There are 254 counties in Texas. It only applied to one, Harris County. Oh, the most diverse county in the state, the one that has the most black people. And the other thing, Terrence, for the people who are saying, well, these HBCUs getting this money, it didn't impact me, guess what? Every HBCU is impact, has an impact on this DMA, the community around it. If those schools didn't get that money, guess what? Restaurants would have actually failed. Dry cleaners, transportation, all of these businesses, uh, people who even work for the institution, would have been all wiped out. So don't think for a second that $7 billion had no impact on black people, Terrence. That's right. And look, black folks, black voters are very sophisticated, Roland. They understand shared fate. Black voters understand linked fate. And, and I've seen it in focus groups where, folk, where you start exposing people to the progress that's been made. It's not, it's, they're not just looking to make sure that they were able to access this progress. They're looking to see who was able to access it. And this is where, you know, the the ad machine that goes on TV in the last 90 days, in the last 30 days, and just lists off a, a, a list of, rattles off a list of accomplishments in Washington, will in fact harden the cynicism that voters feel. Because, look, when you're a cynical voter that doesn't believe systems work for you, it's like a, a young man told me in, in focus groups in Philadelphia, his hood didn't get any better under Obama, it didn't get any worse under Trump. And so what does, what does Biden got to do with him? For a voter like that, that is expressing that level of frustration and cynicism, voters that close to the pain, when we come back and just show them that we spent a billion dollars on infrastructure and $10 billion on climate and $12 billion on and they weren't able to access any of it, it, in fact, hardens the cynicism. But when you, right, but when you say the billions on infrastructure, that. you have to say that school, That's that right. bridge, that building in your city. Oh, I didn't realize that that bridge that I cross every day was raggedy as hell and it got repaired because of that money. You, you just can't, you can't keep talking in these broad deals. In, and and I'm going to go real guerrilla. The Democratic Party, DNC, DSCC, DCCC, all of them, at every damn ribbon cutting in America, where there's a Republican, Republican taking credit, they should be sending at least five to 20 people with, with placards, thank Joe and Kamala, they did this. That's right. That's what you do. In fact, in fact Joe, I, I'll leave, I, I'm sorry, uh, Roland, I'll go even further. They need to be thanking the voters that flipped those states. And in Georgia, I work with New Georgia Project in Georgia, one of the most effective grassroots organizations in the country. And we did a thank you Georgia campaign to, th to, to, to Georgia voters that thank them for child tax credits in Nevada and thank them for child tax credits in Arizona and thank them because they sent those two senators on January 5th of 2023, of, of 2022, to Congress, we were able to, to, to get this progress. And to, to Joy's point, this is how you change the messenger. Just in case we're not able to make Joe Biden the most popular politician amongst black voters, well, well, well this is where we move, we, we shift the hero. Joe Biden doesn't have to be the hero of the story. I was, we were able to raise federal minimum wage to $15 an hour because you voted. We were able to forgive billions of dollars of student loan debt because you voted. We were able to pass the George Floyd executive order that with mandatory body cameras, mandatory, uh, um, uh, I'm sorry, um, mandatory body cameras, pattern and practice investigations, because you voted. And that's how we make them the hero of the story, because that's what's going if to make I, them come out and do it again. Joy, go ahead. Me, uh, Roland, 
if I can just add really quick to Terrence's point, because there's an example of that working. At higher Heights, um, this was during the midterm, during Obama's election. We did a project in Georgia and Ohio, um, engaging black women who had never voted in other elections besides voting for the in the first Obama election. And we didn't advocate for any candidate. All we said is we were talking about black women's vote power and that they have the the power to vote to change this. And this is the result of their um, voting power. We were able to increase turnout by that population that would normally, you know, be just the every four year um, election voters. The, we were able to transform them to vote in regular uh, off year elections, just talking about their vote power and what that would uh, that would result in. One, to see the increase, right? Just talking about giving people information and talking about their vote power enabled them to continue to become prime voters for years to come, right? So, Terrence, there's evidence that that works when we do that. Second part, Roland, which I'm not, I'm sure you are not surprised by, no one has ever asked us how we did it. No one from the National Party, no one from right. any other uh, state party asked us how we did that um, and how we can invest or scale up that project to do it in more states or to do it nationally. Oh, listen, listen, uh, I had no problem. Uh, Delegate Don Scott hit me up and he said, hey, man, can you do in Virginia what you did for Warnock in Georgia? I said, what do you mean? He said, we would love for you, he said, we would love to advertise on your, on your uh, network and for you to bring your show on the ground to five cities. I was like, yeah, we can do that if you advertise. Because guess what? There's a cost to it. I, I mean, that's what, that's what you do. Guess what? When Sean Hannity is doing these town halls across the country, you know why that's happening? Because all of them Republicans, they are dumping billions into Fox News. That's why they're doing it. And so the reality is this here, and I'm going to say it, and I'm being real specific. The fundamental problem, you got white Democratic consultants who do not want to release the funds, and they want to play this game of sending out celebrity influencer money, they don't want to use the advertising money because they get paid by the TV buys. They don't want to put money on the ground to grassroots. I said to M Melody Campbell, they had the, when they met earlier this year in Atlanta, I said that all of these progressive groups out here, the target, I said, Melody, y'all should be telling them 500 million for on the ground efforts targeting black people. That's the number, 500 million. And I said, Black-owned media, in 2020, the Biden campaign released this thing, $281 million ad buy, historic funding of $6 million going to black, black media, when, in fact, most of that money went to, went to white-owned, uh, black-targeted media. It went to Complex. It went to uh, iHeartRadio. Uh, it went to other platforms that were not black-owned. And I'm telling you right now, Fat Joe said it. Yesterday's price ain't today's price. And so uh, I will say to the Biden folks, y'all better be looking at spending upwards of 50 to 100 million with black owned media this year. Because guess what? If you don't have people educating and taking the time, it ain't going to happen. And that's not happening on MSNBC and CNN and these other particular platforms. They are now engaged in a war for the hearts and minds. And what they are doing ain't working. They had better be listening to black people who are on the ground, who touch the ground, who can go into communities. Otherwise, they get their asses handed to them, and that crazy fool is gonna be back in. And we already know the evil that he is going to unleash on America. Final comment, Joy and Terrence, and I'm gonna go after the break, I'm gonna go to my panel. Joy, go ahead, you first. Uh, All I want to say is invest the money and invest the time. You have to build the relationships and you have to do it now. It's called That's return right. on investment. Go right ahead, Terrence. Look, information is persuasion. We are talking about the new swing electorate. You know, these are the swingiest voters in the electorate. They don't need to just be mobilized. They need to be persuaded. That's going to take time. We don't do that in the last minute. And the more we empower them, the more we inform them, the more we move them towards being super voters and not just folks that vote sometime. All right. Uh, Terrence, we'll be here at Georgia Williams. I certainly appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Admiral. 
Uh, before I uh, go to break, real, real quick, uh, somebody named One and Only on YouTube. Democrats funding this station, no doubt. Yo dumbass lying. You lying. Yo dumbass lying. Uh, so uh, there we go with that. Uh, and then let's see. Brother King Lee says, Brother Roland, it is a new day. Many folks are fed up with politics. Guess who's not? MAGA. Guess who's not? White evangelicals. So we go to break. I'm going to come back with my panel. But I need all y'all to understand who's talking about, man, black people fed up with politics. Guess what? Republicans, do you know why they really, really want Trump to win? Because Alito and Clarence are going to retire. And they're going to appoint some 45, 49-year-old young white conservative to lock in their 63 majority. Oh, yeah. Trust me. See, they complain about Biden's age. Alito and Thomas in their 70s. They want to guarantee they have those seats for the next 30 to 40 to 50 years. So for all y'all people talking about we fed up with politics, it's a whole bunch of folk that don't look like us are sitting here going, yes, we want y'all to be fed up. Because what did Donald Trump say in 2020? He says, black people, thank you for staying at home. The man was so arrogant, he literally thanked black people for not voting. Yeah, F around and find out if you want to. We'll be right back on Rolling Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. On the next Get Wealthy with me, Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, inflation is on the rise. Interest rates are high. Can you still thrive during these uncertain times? On the next Get Wealthy, you're gonna meet a woman who's done just that, living proof of what you need to do to flourish during these uncertain times. These are times where you take advantage of what's going on. This is how people get rich or richer. That's right here on Get Wealthy, only on Black Star Network. Next on The Black Table with me, Greg Carr. We welcome the Black Star Network's very own Roland Martin, who joins us to talk about his new book, White Fear, how the browning of America is making white folks lose their minds. The book explains so much about what we're going through in this country right now and how, as white people head toward becoming a racial minority, it's going to get, well, let's just say even more interesting. We are going to see more violence we're going to see more vitriol because as each day passes, it's, it, it is a nail in that coffin. The one and only Roland Martin on the next Black Table, right here on the Black Star Network. Hi, I'm Pastor Jackie Hood Martin, and I have a question for you. Ever feel as if your life is teetering and the weight and pressure of the world is consistently on your shoulders? Well, let me tell you, living a balanced life isn't easy. Join me each Tuesday on Black Star Network for a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We'll laugh together, cry together, pull ourselves together, and cheer each other on. So join me for new shows each Tuesday on Black Star Network, a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. What's up, Geek Tilda? You're the place to be. Got kicked out your mama's university, creator and executive producer of Fat Tuesdays, the air hip hop comedy. But right now, I'm rolling with Roland Martin, unfiltered, uncut, unplugged, and undamn believable. You hear me? Here's the thing that always cracks me up. I, I love to hear when these fools say, uh, oh, uh, Democrats own this. You a hardcore Democrat. You ain't down for black people. This is why anybody saying that is stupid. Everything that I'm laying out is specifically about black power. See, white evangelicals, they know Trump is a fraud. They know it. I need y'all to understand. I actually listened to their conversations. I'm not going to name this Republican um, member of Congress, but I was on an airplane sitting next to a Republican member of Congress who I knew. And 
she flat out made clear how incompetent Donald Trump is. But guess what? He was a means to power. And this is where a lot of people get confused. If I'm looking at the board, I'm saying, what is a means to achieve what it is that we want? So if I, as a black man, want to see police held accountable for their actions, am I going to support the person that appointed the former head of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law to lead the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice? Or am I going to support the guy who had two attorney generals who said that investigating cops was bad for their morale? If I say I believe in criminal justice reform, those are actually my two options. If I say that I am for criminal justice, excuse me, if I say that I am in support of the Affordable Care Act, Medicaid expansion, which played a critical role in decreasing the number of black people who don't have insurance. Am I going to support the person who gladly ran ads and pushed the open enrollment period, or am I going to vote for the person who says, we're going to shut down Obamacare and replace it with something else and in four years never did. I, that, that's, literally, that's literally what I'm looking at. Am I going to support the person who says, I saved HBCUs, and he was only talking about a program that $85 million went to HBCUs, or am I going to support somebody, go to my iPad, who in the area of Cap 5 forgiveness, $1.6 billion dropped the lower third. $1.6 billion was forgiven to HBCUs. CARES Act 1, $352.7 billion. CARES Act 2, $575.5 billion. Million, I'm sorry. Um, uh, CRRSA 1, 583.8 million. CRRSA Act 2, 852.8 million. American Rescue uh, uh, Plan Act 1, 1 billion. American Rescue Plan Act 2, 1.57 billion. Total amount going to HBCUs is 6,567,000,000. 665,681 dollars and 29 cents. If some of y'all sitting there saying, well, I don't, I don't believe that, okay, this is the actual spreadsheet that I got from Congressman Jim Clyburn. These are the institutions. I'm showing you all of these HBCUs were a part of that $6.5 billion. Y'all can sit here and talk about Trump all you want to, but this happened under Biden-Harris. Now, that to me is when you're sitting down, Renita, and sitting down deciding, don't go to the panel yet, because I want to get to the bottom. These are all the HBCUs, y'all. I'm showing you the actual, just so y'all know. Y'all see that? Source, Department of Education. This, y'all, this is the spreadsheet right here. So all these other folk who post videos and saying all kind of crazy shit, I'm showing you the actual numbers down to the cent. That, to me, Renita, is how decisions are being made. What are the things that I care about and which of these two people are likely to deliver or do something about it. 
Well, I've been a candidate for office many times, and I've also won many elections. And I've also had to do thousands of hours of canvassing to get those voters to want to vote for my campaign. And what I can tell you are, what I can tell you is, voters are very simple. You are when you run for election, you're going to have to run off of your record, whatever that is, good or bad. And so some of this is about education that the Biden administration needs to do for voters, but also there's a part of this where the Biden administration needs to start doing things that align with the top priorities of voters. I think when people are saying that they feel like the Biden administration ha or Biden has not done anything, they are they don't literally mean he hasn't done anything. What they're meaning is he has not done what he has not made a dent in their top priorities. And so what I would say to the Biden administration is start listening to voters. You and your guests in the previous uh, segment covered some of it. Part of that is having black consultants who can translate for you what black voters want to see and what the true priorities are. But also, it's not too late. You've got a year, and there are many things that the Biden administration can do to focus on tangible results. Now, capping insulin prices, that is a perfect example of something that is a policy that does not take a long time to explain to voters. It is not something that is overly complicated, which, by the way, that's how voters choose to vote. They're hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I, I don't want you to speed past that, because, again, what you just said... And this is how you say it. Go ask your grandmother and your grandfather and your uncle and your right. aunt who, who are on Medicare and ask them how much money are they now paying for insulin? $35 per month. And then you say, and guess who voted against that? Every Republican. Guess who wants to vote, put that back on the table to get rid of it? Republicans, and you say, I'm not going to let that happen. That, that's a fact. Well, don't even go into who voted <laughs> against it. Just say, I did that, because that is something yeah. that Biden great credit for. And in addition to people's grandparents and uncles, you can even go younger. Our country is struggling with uh, with a diabetes epidemic. And so there are many people like never before who are having to use insulin and we all know it's life-saving and you have basically put a cap on the amount that people will pay. That is life-saving. So I'm glad to see the Biden administration is running some commercials that uh, do talk about the work on capping insulin. But in addition to that, those so those are the sorts of things that voters are going to look for, tangible things that make a difference in their life. Not all this inside baseball about who's DOJ and, and what went where and things like that. Voters are busy. They have families to take care of. They have jobs to go to. They are going to look at what they can tangibly feel. Now, there are a lot of things that the Biden administration can do, decisions they can make today and actions they can take tomorrow to put tangible uh, results in front of people in this last year. Start listening to voters. It is not not too late and make some of those decisions and move forward. The Biden administration needs to do that. The second thing is the Biden administration needs to reckon with their record. As I said before, you run for re-election, you're going to deal with whatever your record was when you were in office. There are legitimate critiques of what the Biden administration has done, unforced errors that people do have. And so a lot of what I see Democrats doing over and over again, which is a mistake, is to condescend to voters and be condescending. If a person feels that they have not had significant change in their life, you are are not going to change that by calling them stupid. What you can do is reckon with the record and the critiques that they do have for you, because also gone are the days where you had to believe everything an elected official told you. You can actually go on the internet and look up if they're walking the walk and if they're talking the talk. And I'm not talking about Twitter and Facebook chats. I am talking about people actually being able to see what you have done that relates to what you said you were going to do. And other times when you've gone in other directions that are different than the values that you campaigned on. I personally think that the Biden administration needs to address these issues head on with voters because it's not going to go away just because you want it to. It's not too late for the Biden administration to save their re-election, but they do have some heavy work to do. Here's why I mentioned DOJ, uh, Omicongo, because one of the biggest criticisms, you didn't get the George Floyd Justice Act done. Well, we know it, first of all, Democrats passed it in the House. So let's just be clear. I love it when people say, CBC didn't do nothing. It passed the House, OK? It didn't go anywhere in the Senate because of Senator Tim Scott and Senator Lindsey Graham. They couldn't get eight other Republicans to go along with it. But the reality is, you do have to say, my executive order did this here. And we are holding people accountable for their actions. No other outlet has laid out the number of people, the guilty pleas, people who have gone to prison for wrongdoing who are cops and wardens. Now, Hey, you got the people running around, okay, man, y'all want to defund the police. No, these are examples of holding people accountable. I say to the Biden-Harris administration, 
They ain't never had Kareem Jean-Pierre talk about this from the podium. You got to talk about it. You got to say how we are, we are committed to justice and the rule of law and stop being afraid of being called soft on the crime. Especially when you're coming off of what just happened in, in Lewiston, in, in Maine and the like, and Republicans are just having the uh, all they can offer is thoughts and prayers. So when we talk about who's soft on these issues, this is another thing that the Biden administration can actually run on and actually speak on as it relates to promoting safety in our, in our schools, on, on our streets, and in our communities. Look, the Biden administration needs to go on a massive media blitz, particularly in Black-owned media and Black spaces, to continually promote their record. The whole situation with everything going on in Israel-Palestine, look, at the end of the day, people can talk about foreign affairs, but they're mostly going to vote on issues relating to domestic policies and things that face them directly. And so they need to get out there and talk about insulin. They need to get out there and talk about the fact that they want Black history to be taught in our schools, right? They need to talk about how about, when was the last time there was a conversation about a woman's right to choose? Like, all of these particular issues that hit home, people can say, well, Trump and Biden are the same as it relates to Israel. Okay, if you believe that, which is not true, but who's going to take away your right to be able to, to, to be pregnant when you want to be pregnant? Who's going to take away your, your right to get access to the type of health care that you need? Those are those basic issues that the Biden administration needs to bring to the streets. And Roland, they have a record on this already, a positive powerful record. And like Renita said, yes, there are missteps and stuff that need to be owned, but when it comes to the direct agenda, it's like night and day. But like Brother Terrence said in the last segment, if, you know, Trump just has the picture with the black presidents of HBCUs, they be like, oh, by, you know, Trump supports that, right? Sometimes people don't want to think too much. It's not that they're not intelligent. Clearly they are, but just got so much on their plate. When you take the message to them, when you advertise to them, when you target them, like this HBCU tour, they need, there needs to be a weekly segment on your show, Roland, with somebody from that administration. Biden needs to come here. VP Harris needs to come here. We appreciate the hip-hop parties and all of those other types of things, but when we're getting closer to this election, we need to also see them coming directly to us with those substantive issues. This re-election is the Biden administration's election to lose. It's like Jay-Z said, I'll mess up a good thing if you let me. Like, this is what's happening right now. And through that whole segment, there was barely a mention of the, of the DNC, except for their failures, right towards the end. And so, look, if this is how Biden wants to roll, we, as Terrence said again, Ter uh, Bob, Trump isn't trying to get 50 plus one. He's trying to get that 33 percent, that 30 percent, and just continually chip away at Biden. And if Biden doesn't continue to respect his number one core, especially when he's losing support from Arab American and in other communities, it's a wrap. But it doesn't have to be this way. That's the biggest issue for me. Julian, this ain't hard. It's not hard. Uh, we've had Alicia Garza and the Black Census Project on this show, and they've reached, you know, 30,000 plus people respond in terms of what the needs and desires are. Uh, we've had numerous other organizations. They're there. But what has to happen is it has to literally be an all-out blitz. This is a ground war. This is where you are trying to... It's just inch by inch. And I'm telling you, I'm, the reason I keep saying white Democratic consultants because their strategy is we're going to raise several billion dollars and we're going to dump everything on TV. I'm telling you right now, that ain't going to do it. That ain't going to do it. That's not, how you, that's not how you won Georgia. That's not how you won Arizona. That's not how you won those states. It's literally going to have to be a, a massive uh, education initiative. What it also means is you're going to have to learn how to flood the zone. And I'm going to say this, and I don't care. The Biden administration, I don't know who their uh, top black male is. And let me be real clear why I'm saying that. When the Biden Harris folks said they talk about Supreme, the Supreme Court Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson, amen. Talk about the black women point to the appellate court. But I'm talking about if you're trying to figure out how do you reach black men, it kind of mm -hmm. helps to send out African-American men who are in the administration yeah. to be talking about the issues. You got the highest-ranking African-American in the Treasury Department. I don't think he's ever been on this show. Don't think so. And the fact that I can't even say his name on the top of my head, right there, we got a problem. Mm -hmm. and, what I'm, and, so, and the reason I'm saying that is this is now micro-targeting. You have to be sending out people 
talking about black economics. You got to be yeah. sending out people talking about black maternal health. You got to be sending out people uh, talking about uh, black housing, not Section 8 housing, but buying homes. Mm -hmm. It's called Oregon. now micro targeting. I'm telling you, to, to, again, to the white consultants, that old strategy of, uh, again, just blanket, one size fit all, it's gone. It is not going to work. If you try to get, and all you white consultants, Obama, you can, I'm telling y'all right now, listen to me right real clear. If y'all think sending Obama to a rally is going to do it, you are wrong. You are wrong. You cannot grow something unless you till the soil, unless you plant something and till it and water it. That's what you have to do. And what you did last time, you have to tell the story, but you also got to tell black folks what you plan to do if you get four more years. That is a reality, Julian. You know, Rolla, my grandmother used to have a saying, you cannot make chicken salad out of chicken spit. And it wasn't spit, and I ain't gonna cuss today. Uh, and basically, you cannot have a victory unless a Democratic Party is really willing to have a come to Jesus with itself. As you mm -hmm. said, the two very brilliant uh, people you had on talking about polling and activism, wonderful, wonderful. Terrence, I've met him at the March on Washington, and he was talking about some of his polling data. Uh, amazing, <clears throat> amazing. But here's the deal. We have people, the Democrats have not gone out to young people in particular. Who's disaffected? Young people are working. Uh, the, now, Kamala had her HBCU tour. That's great for highly educated black people. Everybody does not go to an HBCU. You know, probably two-thirds of black folks are not college educated. Don't mean anything to them. We need to be in the trenches talking to people. We need to change the democratic narrative. And these white consultants need to just go away. Just go away. Hire some black people who know how to do some street heat, who know how to walk door to door, who know how to go to the barbershops, the beauty shops, the restaurants, and talk about what they've done. I love Kareem. Um, she's damn near family. I think she's terrific. But I think that she is taking orders from the wrong people. See, there's a deal. Joe Biden is the titular head of the Democratic Party. He tells the DNC what to do. And he has not told them what to do that basically deals with us. What he's done is let Jamie Harrison, who's a great guy, but I don't think he's on it, what he's done is just say, y'all do your thing. No, if you want to win this election, you, boo, do your thing. Brother Biden, you make some rules, you deal with some stuff. You know, it, it's fascinating, Roland, to look at what's going on. We're giving it away. We're giving mm -hmm. it away. Um, mm -hmm. You know, this Terrence's polls talk about 25% of black men will vote for the orange man today and 20% of black women. What y'all thinking? Well, what they're thinking is that they have not had the kind of connection that they need to move forward. Now, I frankly think that any black person who pulls a lever for the orange man has lost at least some portion of their mind. But as Renita says, that's not useful to say. What's useful to say is this is an administration, as you said, what do you care about insulin? We have twice and a half times the incidence of diabetes in our community. Two and a half times the incidence of diabetes. So you have all these black people who are benefiting from the insulin cap. We have what's happening with education. If uh, that little man from uh, the segregationist from Louisiana has his way, he's talking about cutting Title I by up to 80 percent. That affects our kids more than anybody else. Say that, somebody. Say that. Say, this is why we need the Congress, because we don't need these unfettered fools attempting to take back what has already been established. There are so many small things that could be done by Democrats. But Democrats, I'm thinking about 2016, Roland. Democrats get too complacent 
They have the, we have, because I'm a ride or die Democrat, kind of, but we have all the tools, but we just, oh, we got this, we got this. Well, these polls are telling you, you don't got this. Excuse my violence, but you don't got this. And if you don't do something different, we will be plunged into the depths of hell with a orange man presidency. And we know that. But young people, I mean, I, I, I told you earlier, told folks about these Palestinian kids that I ran into uh, on the street in my neighborhood. And they're like, we will not vote for Biden again. And they were adamant. We were having a very congenial conversation. And then their eyes got hard and their voices harsh. We will not vote for him again. He it, needs it, to go back and get them. Look, he has it, to go back and Kofa and get them. So he, he, here's the final comment before I go to the break. And, and I need people to understand, um, again, how I am seeing this. I could very easily, and I remember having this conversation in 2018. I was talking to a brother. He owns several businesses. And he said, I didn't vote for Trump, but man, I'll be honest, that tax cut has put about a half a million dollars in my pocket. I said, I get it. I said, but the question is this here. Is this about your pocket? Or is it about black people being savagely destroyed left and right? Mm -hmm. And he said, what do you mean? I said, well. And I was using, and we were talking about present, we were talking about examples then, but I'm bringing it present day. How is it I could never, ever consider supporting Trump over Biden? How could I never consider voting for a third party in this race? How could I never consider that? Because, at a, because the week after Buffalo, when 10 black people were slaughtered in a grocery store, a bill was put forth on the floor that called out white nationalism, white supremacy. And every Republican voted against it. That part. Every Republican except one. There was a bill that was put forth on the floor of the House. And the goal was to get rid of racist extremists, neo-Nazis, and white supremacists in the military, and law enforcement, and every Republican voted against it. Donald Trump had lunch with crazy ass Kanye West and a white <laughs> supremacist, a violent racist named Nick Fuentes in Mar a Lago. I can go on. I could talk about health care. I could talk about, as Julian just said, the cuts they want to make to education. All y'all sitting here, man, I ain't feeling this. OK. What do you think is going to happen when massive cuts come to Pell Grants? Hello. We already have the highest student loan debt. The sec Donald Trump and the Republican Party do not support student debt relief. Mm -hmm. Even though 3.5 million people have had student debt relief and it's been $127 billion. So when I look at a multitude of issues and I look at nine nieces and four nephews and I look at parents, dad's 76, mom be 76 in about three weeks, there is no way in the world I can legitimately say I am for black people and support a person and a party that is doing everything they can to decimate black people. Today's Republican Party supports Ed Bloom. 
and getting rid of affirmative action. Yeah. It was 16 mm. Republican attorneys generals the week after Supreme Court decision. They sent to law firms saying your programs, your fellowship programs, they might be unconstitutional and illegal. They are targeting corporate America. They're targeting jobs programs. They're targeting HBCU initiatives. Every single initiative, they're targeting black venture capital funds, the Fearless Fund in Atlanta. So you think for a second that I would even consider these people who are so virulently anti-black? The same poll we're talking about, the same poll we're talking about, in that particular poll, white voters, white conservative voters, say it in the same poll, 58% of them said that blacks and other minorities were getting advantages because of their color. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. 67% of Democratic voters said whites were getting advantages because of their color. Not about the truth. So you think for a second that I, as a black man, am going to be silent and watch these people want to take power to destroy everything that we died and fought for? Black people died and some white people for the 1965 Voting Rights Act. And these people, because of Shelby V. Holder, have already invalidated Section 4, and they're trying to invalidate Section 2? Do you think I'm going to support a party that has deliberately tried to degrade and diminish black voting power in Georgia, Louisiana, Alabama, Florida, Texas, Mississippi, Tennessee, Arkansas? Do you think that I, as a 54-year-old black man, 55 in eight days, will support a party that threw two black men out of the Tennessee House because they dared Tell it. to speak up? Do you think I'm going to support a party that slammed the door of a black woman in Georgia and tried to have her, who was accosted by state troopers? Do you think for a second that I am going to be so arrogant and so silly and so simple and listening to some uninformed rapper and listening to loud mouths on YouTube who all they do is run their mouths but ain't organized nobody, ain't mobilized nobody? Do you think for a second I am going to do that? You have lost your fucking mind. That is not going to happen. And if you think for a second that Donald Trump has the best interest of black people, when that man has methodically and shamelessly trashed every black woman who he has encountered, including Tish James and Fonnie Willis, and the latest on the stand today, that man said she wouldn't know where 40 Wall Street is even located when her offices are across the street from his building. Mm. So you tell me, Black America, you tell me that we're going to sit here. And let me be, let me be clear. The Biden administration ain't perfect. They have, they have not gotten a lot of stuff right, but they damn sure have gotten a lot more stuff right than that buffoon before him. And final point, Donald Trump has said that January 6th defendants are hostages. <laughs> Donald Trump has said if he wins, he is going to pardon every single one of those domestic terrorists 
including the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers, both of them absolute racist. He has said he is going to use the federal government against his enemies in the media and in politics, even people who used to work for him like General Kelly. So you actually think that I'm sitting here tripping because Biden is going to be 82 years old when this man is 77 and he is without a doubt one of the most evil, de calculating, no bottom, narcissistic, lying, cheating, thuggish individuals we have ever seen occupy the White House. And that includes a rose gallery of some straight up hardcore racists like Andrew Johnson and Woodrow Wilson. Mm -hmm. Come on. But go ahead and play around and sit out. Go ahead and dance with that devil. Go ahead and, and sit here and play these games. But I'm telling you right now, it's November 6th. And a year from now, a year from now, don't sit here and have the same reaction the day after the election as you did in 2016. Because all I'm going to say is, we tried to tell you. I'll be right back on Roller Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. about blackness and what happens in black culture we're about covering these things that matter to us uh, speaking to our issues and concerns this is a genuine people powered movement There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting you get it and you spread the word we wish to plead our own cause too long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in Black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Checks and money orders go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037 dash. 0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zell is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. I'm Farad Muhammad, live from LA. And this is The Culture. The Culture is a two-way conversation. You and me, we talk about the stories, politics, the good, the bad, and the downright ugly. So join our community every day at 3 p.m. Eastern and let your voice be heard. Hey, we're all in this together. So let's talk about it and see what kind of trouble we can get into. It's The Culture, weekdays at 3, only on the Black Star Network. Hi, I am Tommy Davidson. I play Oscar on Proud Family, Louder and Prouder. I don't say, I don't play Sammy, but I could. Or I don't play Obama, but I could. I don't do Stallone, but I could do all that. And I am here with Roland Martin on Unfiltered. Americans are living longer. The 85-year-old and up population is expected to double over the next 20 years, making the need for senior care a vital conversation for families. Today, 41 million Americans are caregivers for seniors. Family members or friends provide long-term uh, care, but are we entirely prepared to take on that responsibility? Not being prepared can have a physical, mental, and financial toll on many folks. Dr. Sylvia Perry is the founder of the Caregivers Movement. She joins us from Dallas. Glad to have you here. 
Um, you know, this is something that uh, is, is very interesting. We, we grow up being raised by our parents, going to them for advice and counsel, and then there reaches a point where all of a sudden the roles reverse, where we are having to remind them about medicine, about food, about exercise, about all sorts of different things. Uh, it is hard for people when that shift happens where the children, in essence, become the parents, and the parents, in essence, become the children. Yes, it is so hard. Thanks for having me today, Roland, to talk about this. It is National Family Caregivers Month, and the role of caregivers is ever expanding, and every day is a new journey. And just like you said, the roles reverse. And so many people are in that sandwich generation where they're caring for older loved ones and they're also caring for their children whilst trying to maintain a career. Career, And that's not the archetype that we're used to of a caregiver. So a caregiver, it, one in four caregivers are millennials. The look of a caregiver is changing and we need um, society to catch up with that. And, uh, you know, a lot of folks, when, we, when you talk about... Um you know, financial. Um, uh, I remember, I mean, look, my, my parents retired early, so I think at 62. And, and I remember for me, uh, I had to say, hey, I am not going to be paying for these things today um, because there are things that I'm going to have to be paying for down the road. Uh, there are financial decisions that we have to make. Uh, today when it comes to travel and all sorts of different things along those lines, uh, when it comes to uh, the things that we want to be able to provide, amenities, you name it. But we have to think about, okay, but if that person continues living, how do we take care of that person? Where are they going to live? How are they going to live? You know, I have the benefit uh, of parents who still are mobile, who they're, they're not in walkers and not in, in scooters and things, anything like that. But when you start talking about somebody's health beginning to fail, uh, there's all sorts of stuff you think about. And the last thing you want to do is, man, uh, start thinking about the thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars that I spent on all kind of other stuff that I really need now uh, to take care of them. It is definitely a balancing act, one that we didn't quite know to prepare for in such a major way. The cost of care in the United States has skyrocketed um, since pre-pandemic levels, so it's hard to plan. Um, even if you have a great career and are planning, it can still knock you off your feet. So we need society, government, corporations, everybody to step up to support caregivers, family caregivers. Um, one of the highest turnover jobs is long-term care, people that take care of people in nursing homes and memory care centers, because the work is also not financially just financially taxing, but it is mentally taxing as well. Coordinating care, not only for yourself and your family, but your loved one as well. It, it takes an emotional toll, and many times you'll see caregivers fall ill while they're taking care of someone else. Uh, and you've got to also deal with family. Uh, and you've got to, and this is hard for some folk, uh, because we see this a lot in black families. Well, you know, who's making the most money? You should be doing this. But reality is, uh, it's, it's all shared. When I was at the funeral for uh, Johnny Gill's mother, um, remember Greg Mathis in his eulogy talked about how uh, their mother uh, did not go to any doctor's appointment by herself. Uh, one of those sons was always with her. And they had to sit here and talk about who's doing what, who's coming home. And so they had to work out rotations when it came to taking care of their mother. That's the stuff that folk don't think about. It's so true. It's so true. And I like to encourage people to have a plan and have a care team. We hope these days don't come, but we need to plan for them, especially with the world the way it is being I don't like to use the word post-pandemic because COVID is still very much around, but in an endemic world. Um, have a plan. Sit down. Start those conversations early with your loved ones so you know what they're okay with, what they're not okay with. Also, with your siblings or cousins, whoever you think will be a part of your care team, start those conversations early before the need materializes. And that way, you kind of have a loose working plan that you can 
refer back to when you're in maybe some very urgent or swift moving situation? For the, my panel, I, I remember my grandfather, uh, he passed away when I was 15 years old. Uh, that was a family gathering and he said, let me be perfectly clear. If any of y'all think about putting me in a nursing home, I'm kicking all y'all's asses. Uh, he, he had eight kids and I was sitting there and I was kind of like, <laughs> y'all got a decision on y'all hand. Uh, he never went to a nursing home. Uh, he, before he, his last days, he lived in that house until his last days. He was like, I'm just letting y'all know that ain't happening. Uh, I got to kick it and listen to that conversation. But that's just, but, but we have to understand that that's, I mean, we're going to have to deal with stuff like that. I still crack up. My grandfather did that. Uh, let's see here. Julian, you're first. Okay, my mom died in uh, 2021. She was 93 years old. She was a gerontologist, uh, which meant she told us, I am not going out in an old folks' home. She was in a rehab place after two strokes, and uh, we had to re retrofit the house that we grew up in to have a, 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 a stair thing so she could get her wheelchair up, moved a lot of stuff out of the hallway. But it was a labor of love. One of our biggest challenges was the caretakers. Everybody had jobs. In fact, I went to L.A. for two years because my sisters were mad at me. They said, we see you partying on Facebook, and we're changing bedpans. So I tried to get out there to help do my share, but she died, like, literally a week before I got to L.A. But in any case, neither here nor there, one of the biggest challenges we had was dealing with caretakers. We had all kinds of insurance. It was really hard to get people to be really reliable. Sometimes they didn't show up. Um, the, the, yeah, I can't. It's a, it's a lot, and everybody's had to deal with it. We're not unique. What can we do? Is there something that can be done to better compensate? I mean, we're working through an agency, um, long story. But anyway, how can we make sure that caretakers are more reliable? That is a great question. Um, I think that compensation is not that great. Um, I think the average was around twelve to fifteen dollars, and for the work that you're doing, 40. we were paying forty. Forty. Oh. Okay. Well, that's awesome. Um, that is awesome. A lot of times, the people that do that work, though, it is a high burnout rate. So even with financial compensation that is excellent. It, the burnout rate and the physical demands of the job can be very, very hard. I think that vetting people as much as you can, um, working with very reputable agencies and asking them what their plan is to keep their employees engaged and coming to work is uh, one tactic that you could use. And also making sure they feel appreciated. I know that sounds very simple, but um, not that was the case for you. But sometimes, you know, they're taking care of our loved ones and we don't know what they're walking home to or if they have some reservations or guilt about being here for our families and not their families. So I think um, personal attachments and bonds can help kind of mitigate some of the not showing and um, just the demands of transportation, things like that. I think that until this country has a serious conversation about the work of caregivers and caretakers, we are gonna continue to see these issues and um, we need a systematic approach to elevate that role to something that can be a sustainable wage and that the work is a little less demanding. I'm a Congo. Thank you so much, Dr. Perry, for your incredible work and dedication. Uh, the question I have is, what advice do you have for people who may think their only two options are, I either keep the person I'm caring for at home, or I have to go through the process of finding an <laughs> expensive uh, home, you know, care uh, facility that I can enroll them in? I feel like nowadays there are so many other options in between options that many of us just are not aware of. Could you speak to that? Yeah, that's a great point. I think that educating ourselves, there's a lot of good books out there that tell you about the different types of care, respite care, home care, um, in-home care facilities. 
And I really encourage people to tap into their local resources. Um, the Senior Source is something that we have here in Dallas. And there are grants. There are people that will come to your house just to hang out with your loved one. That's their, they volunteer. This is something that they like to do. Maybe they were a caregiver in the past and they've lost their loved one. They will come and sit with your loved one. So I think initially, what would be the ideal situation? You need to figure that out with your loved ones and family members. And then start spreading the word. Um, senior agencies, places like that will have all of the different resources that are available to you in your local community. And there's so many hybrid options that um, that is one thing that is better about caregiving today versus 20 years ago. Uh, Renita. Thanks for being here. This is such an important topic. Um, speaking about family caretakers, so my mom was has been a was a nurse for many many decades, and at one point she worked home health. And what she swears to to this day is that a lot of times you'll see the caretaker die before the person that they're taking care of because the job of caretaking is so taxing. Um, it just really can put somebody through the ringer. So what what resources or support? Is there available for caretakers and advice um, as to what they can do to make sure that they don't die before, you know, d that they don't die trying to take care of their loved one beyond the obvious take care of yourself sort of advice that we always hear for caretakers? What else can you talk about? Support, advice, just what? Yeah, you bring up a very, very, very important point. A lot of times you will see that or they'll have some um, medical event that renders them unable to take care of their loved one anymore. Outside of the, just the generic take care of yourself, I say speak up. Have your care team, so your friend, siblings, whoever you can go to, that you can tap them in when you need a break. Boundaries. Um, because I think not only being a caregiver, you're managing so many things and using so much mental energy that time, uh, you don't realize that the whole day has gone by and you haven't done call to make your doctor's appointment, you've missed your mammogram, your flu shot, et cetera, et cetera. So making sure you set boundaries and parameters where you have a care day and self-care is not just getting our nails done and getting grooming done. It is actually doing those things that are going to keep us healthy. Um, making sure that you can tell people, hey, I am not in a position where I can do this today. How can you help me? Can you go pick up the groceries? Hey, I put an order in. Can you do this? So asking people to be there for you in your personal community. Also making sure you have great relationships with your health care team. Every caregiver should be on a first name basis with their pharmacist and, and the person that they take care of their pharmacist. I'm a pharmacist by trade, and we're the most accessible health care professionals. So in many regards, they can help you take some of that management piece away and help you manage. Um, both your medical situation with your loved one and yourself, and then also with your doctor. I, I would say if you're a caregiver, you need to let your doctor know that because it's a very, very high stressful situation and mental health professionals. I know that that's unfortunately still taboo in many spaces, but you have to get in to see someone, a therapist, a counselor, a psychiatrist, a psychologist. It is essential to you maintaining your mental health and also your physical health. Doc, how can people uh, reach you for more information? Yes, you can connect with me on all social media at Dr. Sylvia Perry. That's D-R-S-Y-L-V-I-A. Or connect with me on my website, www.drsylviaperry.com. All right. We appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. Folks, a final note, a Colorado jury acquits another officer in the Elijah McClain murder trial. After two and a half weeks of testimony, the jury found Nathan Woodyard, the third Aurora police officer, on trial for the 2019 death of Elijah McClain, innocent of reckless manslaughter. The trial focused on what had ultimately killed McClain, who was stopped walking home from a convenience store on August 24, 2019. He was reported to 911 as suspicious for wearing a black ski mask and listening to music. After the police stopped him, officers quickly became physical with McLean. Last month, a separate jury found one officer, Randy uh, Rodima, guilty of criminally negligent homicide and third-degree assault. The other officer, Jason Rosenblatt, was acquitted of all charges. The city of Fort Worth is proposing a $3.5 million settlement 
for one of two lawsuits filed by the family of Atiana Jefferson, a black woman killed by a Fort Worth police officer. Jefferson was shot and killed in October 2019 through the bedroom window of her home by Fort Worth police officer Aaron Dean, who was sentenced last year to nearly 12 years in prison for manslaughter. Fort Worth City Council members will vote on the settlement at a future undisclosed meeting. All right, let me thank Renita Omakongo and Julian for being on today's panel. Thank you so very much. Folks, as you see, I'm rocking my Alpha Vote shirt. Elections are taking place tomorrow. We need y'all out in Kentucky to defeat Daniel Cameron, who's running for governor. That's the black Republican who did nothing for Breonna Taylor. So Andy Brashear should be elected. Tate Reeves has done nothing for black folks in Jackson and Mississippi. And so please stand with Brandon Presley in that race as well. The black vote can be critical in both of those gubernatorial races. You've got Sheila Jackson Lee, Congresswoman, who's running for mayor of Houston. We need Houston to show up and show out uh, as well, <clears throat> following the two successful terms a male mayor, Sylvester Turner. If in Virginia, if Democrats flip three House seats, just three, they'll get the first black Speaker of the House in Virginia history. And so go to our social media and uh, look at those uh, Virginia Democrats we've been telling you about. You've got ballot initiatives all over the country. You've got in Ohio, abortion is on the ballot. You've got a state Supreme Court race in Pennsylvania. You've got the city council races in Philadelphia. Uh, at, look, in a lot of the Dallas areas, you've got uh, pro propositions on the ballot to fund uh, school districts, to, t uh, to raises for t teachers, you name it. So a lot of things are happening all across the country. Please, folks, do me a favor. Find out if there is an election in your area. And if it is, and you're registered, Vote. Use your power. Do not allow it to sit unused. I'll see you guys tomorrow from Dallas. I'm Roland Martin on the Black Star Network. Don't forget, support us in what we do. Your dollars make it possible for us to do what we do. The conversations that we have ain't happening everywhere else. They're not. The conversations, you're not seeing Terrence Woodbury and L. Joy Williams being, having that in-depth conversation on MSNBC, CNN, ABC, NBC, CBS, and damn sure not Fox News. Other black-owned media ain't having the conversation. You don't see a daily show on TV One. You don't see it on BET. You don't see it uh, on uh, Revolt. You don't see it on any of these black-owned or black-targeted uh, networks. Sure, the Grio, they've got two shows, one hour each, but nobody does five hours of original content every single day like the Black Star Network. Uh, I don't charge a subscription fee. Uh, your contributions, our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing on average 50 bucks each. That's $4.19 a month, 13 cents a day. Trust me, if you can't do 50 bucks, that $1, $5, $10 absolutely matters when it comes to our travel, when it comes to our studio, uh, paying our staff, our freelancers, all of that. We're at, uh, down about $290,000 compared to last year, so we're short. Uh, we appreciate all of your support. Uh, so between now and the end of the year, let's close that gap because trust me, we want to go into 2024 ready to cover the critical issues that black people are facing all across this country. And we talk about the importance of black owned media, but it's one thing to actually do it, to talk about it, but it's another thing to actually do it. We're doing it, but it has to be funded. And we're fighting a good fight to get those political dollars, fighting a good fight to get those advertising dollars. They simply are not funding us the way they are white mainstream media. And so you can send your check and money order to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. Cash App, dollar sign, RM Unfiltered. PayPal, R. Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale, Roland at RolandSMartin.com. Roland at RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. All y'all folks on YouTube watching, hit the damn like button, okay? We should easily be at 1,000 likes while we're sitting at 997. Get it done. Also, folks, folks, download the Black Star Network app, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung, Smart TV. Support our 24-hour streaming channel available on Amazon uh, News. So go to Amazon Fire. Also tell Alexa, play news from the Black Star Network. You can watch us on Plex TV, Amazon Freebie, also on the live grid of Amazon Prime Video. And be sure to get a copy of my book, White Fear, how the browning of America is making white folks lose their minds. Available at bookstores nationwide. Get the audio version. I read it myself on Audible. Again, folks, 
tomorrow is election day. I want to see y'all with those stickers and put it on social media saying, I voted. I want to see uh, that stuff happen. And so I'll have mine because I'm flying back uh, to Dallas. I got to get some work done, but I'll be casting my ballot as well. I'll see y'all tomorrow right here on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Holla! Folks, Black Star Network is here. Hold no punches! I'm real um, revolutionary right now. Like, Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. Uh, thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roland. Hey, Black, I love y'all. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig?